Hello and welcome to our immigrant row house. So in the factory village, the workers lived in houses that were built all in a row called row houses. Sometimes they were called company houses because they were owned by the company of the factory. And sometimes they were called tenements, which means several families living in the same house. Many of our uh, worker houses here in Connecticut are called duplexes. They have two front doors and two families. This is the kitchen and they are going to prepare their meals here. They're going to eat in here. They're going to do laundry in here. Um, and they're going to heat hot water for bathing and washing up in here. So this is the stove and this is the very important part of the house. It's for cooking and it's for the heat in the winter time. It heats the house. Sometimes these stoves are used with wood, but we're going to use coal in the city. Coal comes out of the ground. Coal miners go down into the ground to mine the coal and it's a non-renewable fossil fuel and it burns, it catches on fire. So we can use this to make a fire in the firebox. And now let's take a look at how they did laundry. Doing laundry, washing clothes and sheets and towels a hundred years ago was a lot harder than it is today. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have to go outside to the pump and get some water and heat it up on the stove and we're going to maybe have to do two or three or four pots full. Then we're going to pour the hot water into, into the wash tub. All right, next we're going to have to grate some soap so that we have laundry soap. And this is soap. Now we can buy soap at the store. But we've been also, uh, for generations, made our own soap at home. So we'll grate a little soap into the water. Now we're ready to wash our clothes. And they would use a washboard for the scrubbing. And they would wa wash it in the water and then scrub and then scrub and try to get out all the dirt and the stains. Then when the scrubbing is done, now we want to wring it out, which squishes out all the excess water so it'll dry quickly on the clothesline. So we put the item here, and it's soaking wet, we're pretending, and then we put it through, and we wind the crank. That would be children's job, and all the excess water goes back into the tub. The last step of doing laundry is to iron the clothes. They ironed everything because these, a lot of their clothes were 100% cotton and became very wrinkled. So they ironed them so they'd look neat and tidy. So ironing using an iron, which is made out of iron. That's why we call it that. It's made out of iron. By the way, this is very heavy. And the way it would get hot, you see it doesn't have a cord, is that they would heat it up on the stove and it would get hot from metal to metal. And while that one is heating up, I'll use one that's already hot and I'll use this to do my ironing. And while I'm ironing, I'm probably also talking to my children and I'm probably also watching the baby. One of the things that's very different from living in a mill town in the 1800s to today is that they didn't have plumbing. So plumbing is your bathroom and your kitchen sink and uh, toilets and showers and bathtubs and running water. So what they would do is they would take a bucket or a pail and they would go outside and there would be a well, a pump on a well that the whole neighborhood would use. So they would take their bucket and they would pump the water and when you get this going, the water flows into the bucket. They didn't have a bathroom with a bathroom sink. So when they wanted to wash up, they would use a pitcher of water and a basin. And if they had hot water, it's because they heated it up on the stove. 
So they would pour the water into the basin, and then they would use this with soap and water to wash up. So how did the children take a bath in the 1800s? Because they didn't have running water. So they might have a child's bathtub. Not everybody would, but some families would have a child's bathtub. So this tub is empty, and so we have to pump the water at the well, take the bucket of water, heat it up on the stove, and then pour the water into the tub. Now adults can't fit in here. I can't fit in here. I'm gonna have to take a sponge bath, but I might use this tub to soak my aching feet. If there are four or five kids in the family, they will all take a bath in the same water. And the baby goes last because the baby poops their pants. And there's an old saying and it says, don't throw the baby out with the bath water, which means by then the water is pretty dirty. You don't want to miss the baby. So to use the toilet, which they didn't have, they had outhouses, little buildings outside where they would go during the day. But at night, or in the winter, or if somebody's sick, they would use the potty in the house. And then they would have to bring it outside to empty it in the outhouse. So this is what the pot looks like. And it's, they're usually glass. And in the colonial days, they called them chamber pots because bedrooms were called chambers. And in this time period, the industrial age or the Victorian era, we call them gazundas because it goes under the bed. Or they called them thunder pots. And maybe you can guess why. When we talk about artifacts, objects in the museum that we learn from, I ask the students, what do you think this is? And they say, oh, it's a casserole dish for a casserole. And I say, no, it's not. It has one handle to hold it out like this. A casserole dish usually has two handles. In our museum, we have a lot of objects that show us what people used to have in the 1800s. And from these objects, which we call artifacts, we learn about people's lives. Their shoes were like boots, and they are made from leather. Leather comes from animal skins. And also, they have cotton shoelaces. So what this tells us is that they were using natural materials. Our next artifact is this. And what is this? It's made from wood and it's called a darning egg. And what you do with this is, if you have holes in your socks, a hole in the heel or a hole in the toe, they would mend it up. They would put the darning egg inside and they would use that to so, so when I put my needle in, I have something to put it against, and now I am sewing up the hole in the sock. I'm using red thread so you can see the stitches. So what this tells us about the people that used it is that they didn't have a lot of money. The reason why they would mend the socks, the holes in their socks, is because they made these socks and they are going to mend them. Um, they, today, we just throw away our socks when we have a hole, but they're not going to do that. They're going to mend the hole in the socks because they were frugal, which means thrifty, which means they didn't have a lot of money. Our last artifact is a stereoscope. Now they had photographs and cameras from the 1840s. But by the late 1800s, they also had 
3D pictures. So the stereoscope has a double picture, and when you look into it, you see one 3D picture. I have to adjust it for my eyes, and this is a great way for me to see the world. As a mill worker, I probably would never travel. I would be pretty much in the same town my whole life. But I would be able to see in pictures Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, the Great Rocky Mountains. I would be able to see them in 3D with the stereoscope. So this stereoscope is for what we call leisure time. When the mill workers had Sundays off, they had leisure time. When the boss's family, they have more time off and they have leisure time to look at pictures and do fun activities. So what this tells us about the people that used it is that they had leisure time to enjoy some of the fruits of their labor by purchasing something that would show them three-dimensional pictures, the stereoscope. The mill town attracted a lot of workers to work in the factory, and most of them were immigrants. Some of them were the Yankee farm girls and boys coming from the farms, but many of them were immigrants and immigrant whole families that immigrated to these mill towns in Connecticut to work in the factories. An immigrant is someone who leaves one country and moves to a whole new country to start a new life. So here in Willimantic, the first major group was Irish, and then there were French Canadians, and Italians, Polish, Lithuanians, Latvians, Russians, Czech, Germans, Turks, Lebanese, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and South Americans. Those are some of the groups of immigrants that came to work in the factories here in town. The first group that came, and the biggest group, that came to Willimantic to work in the factories were Irish. And they came in the 1850s because something terrible happened in the late 1840s, in 1847, 48, and 49, there was a potato famine. A famine means not enough food and everybody's gonna go hungry. So what happened was, the potatoes were the main crop. And it's not the only crop. They grew carrots and cabbages and beets and other things. But this was the main crop, potatoes. So, what happened in those years in the 1840s? There was some kind of disease or blight, and it made all the potatoes turn black, and there was nothing to eat. So the landlords came to collect their, the, the bounty of the gardens, and they couldn't take the potatoes. They took anything that was good to eat, and they went back to England, and they left the Irish to starve. Hundreds, thousands, maybe a million Irish starved. And when they were very impoverished and undernourished, they became diseased and got sick. So they died of either starvation or disease. And another million Irish said, we've got to get out of here or we're going to die too. And so over the next 10 years, the Irish came from Ireland in Europe, and they sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, and they landed in New England, in New York, in Boston, in Canada, and they needed a job. And some of their first jobs were working in the factories, in the factory towns, or helping to build the railroads. The railroads were being built right about that time, in the 1850s. So, the Irish came looking for opportunity, looking for jobs, looking for a better life, and they came, they left Ireland because of the Great Famine, the Great Potato Famine.
Hello and welcome to the manager's house or the boss's mansion. So this time period, the industrial age, has another name. It's called the Victorian era. Sometimes we say the hats and the clothes were Victorian or the decor of the house or the architecture of the outside of the house are Victorian. And we say that because Queen Victoria is the Queen of England. So in the Victorian era, the people who had money had a lot of very fine things, fine dishes, fine linens, fine clothes. They always wore beautiful hats. Another thing that happened in this industrial age and Victorian era is it's the age of inventions. There are lots of new inventions. There was the Victrola. You might know it as a record player, or today we have CD players. Another invention was the early telephone. When telephones came to town, there were only 70 people and businesses that had a phone. Hello, operator? Can you please get me my friend Suzanne? Yes, yes, I'll wait, thank you. Not everybody had a phone. Another invention was the pump organ where they could play music and they had music in their house and singing. So there were lots of inventions. And the toys, the toys that the children had in this house, they had really beautiful toys that would have been purchased at the store. But the mill worker children, they would have had nice toys made from wood or cloth, usually made by the parents or the aunts and uncles. So they would have a rag doll where the, the boss's daughter, her name was Helen. She had a beautiful doll and dollhouse bought from the store. So thanks for visiting the museum and learning about how people lived in the 1800s in a Connecticut mill town. <laughs>